200 mile uh, gerrymander that divvies up people based on the color of their skin. The lines are drawn. Why are we wasting taxpayer dollars to go up to Tallahassee to pretend like we're doing something? Race and law take center stage as lawmakers head to vote on Florida's congressional district. Something significant is going to have to be done uh, and it's going to have to be done quickly. Fixing the property insurance crisis. There are four and a half million condos in Florida, and we need to make sure this doesn't happen again. Fixing the condo safety crisis. We are at one of the refugee assistance centers. We need to help them. We need to help them as much as possible. The chair visits the war zone. That could happen here. It could happen anywhere. The big news of the week, all live this week in South Florida. Good morning. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg. Let's go to the maps, the ones that will affect Florida's political landscape for years to come. State lawmakers head back to Tallahassee Tuesday, their version of redistricting vetoed by the governor in an unprecedented move. Now they're going to be considering another version of the maps drawn by the governor's direction that will likely affect the strength of minority voters and the balance of power in Congress. At issue here, districts that are fair, compact, and equitable, and protect minority voices. Democratic State Senator Jason Pizzo of North Miami and Republican Senator Jeff Brandis of St. Petersburg have been immersed in the redistricting process. They're on opposite sides of the aisle, but they often find ways to work together, and we're glad to have them together this morning. Senators, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Jason Pizzo, if I may uh, begin with you, but Jeff Brandis, want to hear you on this too. Uh, the governor certainly has the right, the power to veto the congressional redistricting maps put before him, but he has never before had the power to draw those maps. Why did the legislature abdicate its responsibility and give him the power to do it? Because most of my re Republican colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I'll make an exception for my buddy Jeff, uh, coward or whatever the governor wants. He, he has very high approval ratings. He's got a war chest for his uh, campaign re-election. And it's uh, the worst kept secret that he'll threaten primaries uh, and, and, and people's basically uh, political livelihood going forward. I, I guess, Jeff, Brandis, the other side of that coin would be, um, well, according to the governor, his people actually worked with the legislative map makers to come up with something he's got to sign off on anyway. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, at the end of the day, he gets the he gets the yes or no vote as to his veto pen or not. Uh, and so ultimately, you know, largely the legislature is left to looking at the maps and determining whether the maps that he presented are constitutional. Uh, and I think there are benefits, uh, as I've seen to his some of his some of his maps. For example, my city now has potentially two congressmen, which I think is obviously better than one. So there are benefits for individual members. But I think we have to look, obviously, at the state as a whole. Yeah, uh, Jeff Brandis, uh, the map, the last one we saw, there have been several iterations here, but the last map we saw from the governor's office had 20 congressional districts going to the Republicans, your party, in Florida, and eight going to the Democrats. And just on a basis of fairness, that doesn't seem fair in, in a state that Donald Trump won by 3% of the vote in 2020. Well, I don't think you can look at it like we're drawing, you know, one way or the other. I think ultimately the question is, are the districts constitutional? Are they compact enough? Uh, do they do they look like uh, the state of Florida? Uh, and are they are they situated in such a way that they meet constitutional and statutory uh, muster? And so I think that's really what the question is. It's what we're going to be asking the attorneys and other professionals who do this every day uh, to, to help us make that determination as we go into special session this week. All right, so let's do some really plain talk here. The map, for, for everyone watching, this is the most eye-glazing topic for television <laughs> ever, but so critical for every single person watching. And the districts, if we, let's put up some maps and show what the districts are going to look like and why the lines are important and the gerrymandering, the wild lines that, that the, the people in power can put in to protect their own voting, that's gone, presumably. So the governor comes up with a map that says he's getting rid of what was gerrymandering to benefit a racial minority block. He wants race neutral, those were his words, quote unquote, race neutral voting. 
The Florida Constitution actually makes compact and contiguous uh, a law when drawing the maps. However, the, the U.S. Voting Rights Act does have an eye toward protecting minority votes, both race and language minority votes. So both of you take on, Jason, let's start with you. How do we protect minority votes and make this race neutral? Is that a thing? It is a thing, and it's a thing we need to be mindful of. Uh, you know, just I want to just put this in context, sort of separation of, of powers here. The Secretary of State in a lawsuit that's open right now against the maps that we did pass, uh, the Secretary of State has asked the court to put basically put a stay on those proceedings on the litigation challenging those maps because, quote, the legislature's responsibility is to draft maps for reapportionment for congressional seats, and yet we haven't. We're being spoon fed something the governor's given us. Glenna, we're going to go from distinctly and objectively four performing black congressional districts just to two, 20 and 24. The governor said, we're not going to have a 200 mile long gerrymander. And yet the proposed 18th congressional district goes from Polk in the northwest all the way down to Hendry, you know, to the southeast. That's 180 miles long. And while, you know, Senator Brandis talks about splitting, it's nice to have two, you know, to hedge. But basically, you know, we're jumping over large swaths of water to go grab and to try to dilute minority representation. So we're going from four to two objectively in black performing. He says we're not going to have a 200 mile gerrymander, but it's going to be 180 miles wide uh, on another one. It's OK there, just not up there. And remember, we passed 8019 version 8019 in the maps, which did not have a 200 mile long gerrymander, as, as he classifies. It actually was compact into the Duval area that was presented to him and he vetoed that. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Brandis, uh, Governor DeSantis the other day when he was in Miami was talking about race neutral districts and he cited as sort of the defense for doing this a 2017 U.S. Supreme Court decision that said the North Carolina General Assembly had violated the 14th Amendment uh, equal protection by drawing a couple of districts that allowed a black candidates to be elected. In fact, they were elected. And he says, we've got to be, you know, in, in lockstep with the U.S. Supreme Court on that, dis on that decision. Uh, is that really sort of the prevailing legal moment we're in? Well, look, I think there's no doubt that these maps are immediately going to enter into court and, and ultimately likely to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, I think these these maps are going to be challenged day one. The, the current maps that we have, which you know passed to overwhelm, with overwhelming support, and we believe were constitutional as well, were challenged. So I don't think there's any way that we're going to end without being challenged. Uh, that's going to work itself through the courts. Uh, and, you know, when I was first elected in 2012, all our maps were thrown out and I had to run again in a new district in 2014. Right. So I, I won't be surprised if these things end in court and there are some changes to the lines going forward. All right. When, when you two, say but two elections will yeah, pass ahead, before Jason. we actually get a remedy. I'm sorry. Say again, please. Two elections will pass. 2022 yeah. election is going to move forward with these proposed maps and likely 24 by the time we hear back from the courts. Yeah, I wanted to follow up, uh, Jeff Brandis, by asking uh, when you say they end up in court, there were so there was a lawsuit filed in state court in Leon County and then it was withdrawn. And now there is a court date set in federal court, you know, before three judges in May. Uh, is that likely where this will all end up? Absolutely. A hundred percent. This is going to end up in court. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I think, you know, anybody who's betting would be all in to, to bet that this is going to be in court. But the question is, can we on on its good on a faith on a good faith effort believe that this is these are constitutional maps? I think the governor has has put forth maps. At least our committee staff is telling us that they're constitutional. The chairman of the committee believes they're constitutional. Uh, and so going forward with only one map to vote on that we hear is constitutional, uh, we have to kind of take them at their word that they are, that they believe they are constitutional. I am not an attorney. I do not look at the maps every day and, and try to determine what is constitutional and what's not. But I do rely on the good faith effort of those who work with us every day uh, and, and their expert legal opinions as we go forward here. And you know what else there is, is this very complicated mathematical calculation. And if uh, the, in the governor's transmittal letter this week, his uh, council backed it up with all of the graphs and all of the charts where they calculated the compactness of the district. Jason, if, if it is to be believed, and there's no reason, frankly, not to believe the mathematical calculations that they put there, 
the governor's map does seem to make things more compact by the numbers, which is in the Florida Constitution. Does that matter? It, it matters if you're if you're doing the look over here, look over here. But in places, I don't think that are uh, and I don't, don't know that most viewers are, are con concerned, you know, today, this morning, watching this program about Polk, Collier and Hendry County. But they should be, because when it's all about focusing on this district up in northeast Florida and really what does it mean for our, our southeast region districts, um, I, I think there are going to there are going to be issues. And I, I just I, I can't accept the same sort of premise about acting in good faith. Maybe it's because I have a law degree and a finance degree, but I, I, I think the math works. Uh, what, when you want it to work, when it when it goes unchallenged, which it most certainly will be, and it's glaring and objectively just worse. It, it's it's worse for representation, and and it's it's in, runs in firm of, of the tenants that we have. Yeah. All right. We are speaking with State Senators Jason Pizzo of North Miami and Jeff Brandis of St. Petersburg. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are glad you are with us on this Easter Sunday, Passover and Ramadan with Senator Jeff Brandis of St. Petersburg and Senator Jason Pizzo of North Miami. Uh, gentlemen, as you well know, this special session is called Just on Redistricting. But Senator Brandis, you have been the leading proponent, the leading voice saying that we ought to be talking about property insurance. Explain your position. Why? Why is that so critical? Listen, there was a number of bills left on the table uh, during this legislative session dealing with making housing more affordable, uh, dealing with the condo collapse, and frankly, dealing with property insurance. And I believe that property insurance is really the number one crisis facing the state of Florida right now. Uh, we've lost an insurance company a month for the last four months. Uh, in fact, we, we had one downgraded just on Friday, and they can currently no longer write federally backed mortgages. And so, you know, we're, we're in imminent collapse uh, in a variety of different areas. Even citizens' property insurance is growing by about 6,000 policies a week right now. Yeah. And so what you have is the private market that's pulling out of the state. They're shrinking. Every single company uh, of the kind of admitted smaller carriers of the state of Florida shrank, shrank last year in market share. Citizens has now doubled almost in, in the last year and a half. And, and that's just not sustainable for the state of Florida. Uh, and we're very concerned about what, what this means going into hurricane season, which starts June 1st. And you are not alone in calling it the most pressing issue of the state right now. Uh, four days of session. I think we're all in agreement that this is not going to happen this week. But the governor this week did say he was all for a special session on property insurance. If the legislature could come in with a framework of workable ideas. Jason, what are the ideas on the table now? Well, there are a number of them. Some of them may seem like tough love measures, perhaps. Uh, but I, I'll tell you, this is not sort of a Johnny come lately situation. Senator Brandis, um, my roommate in Tallahassee, actually, uh, has been at the forefront of this for a while and sounding the call. It's very icky, I think, for, for some people or parties to discuss issues that, that might have some costs associated with it or, or some learning curve, whether it's reserves and, and stress tests and, and, and viability and where dollars are being directed. Um, that's one condo reforms another, uh, but um, this is something that's sort of a nonpartisan issue. It should should be a nonpartisan issue. It does get complicated uh, by it. Yeah. So, Tom, excuse me for one second. T uh, Tom Fabricio, the rep from Miramar, who uh, is heavily into crafting some of this framework, this week told me that he considers fraud, people gaming the system, the cost of litigation as the a number one problem in controlling the cost that seems to put the onus on consumers and and possibly that's where it should go but but jeff brandis what about the insurance companies is the onus on them in certain ways to really come up with something or lawmakers come up with something that insurance companies from out of state who are who are undercapitalized i mean what, what is the issue there well, frankly, the insurance companies just don't want to sell property insurance in Florida because of the amount of fraud and litigation that goes on here. Florida will see over 100,000 lawsuits this year in property insurance. And for every other state around the country, it's less than 1,000. So what we have to do is fundamentally realign incentives, allow people to price their policies in their pocketbooks. We've got a fixed citizen's property insurance. The most pressing issue is the reinsurance crisis that we're facing. Most of the property insurance companies in Florida are thinly capitalized. They rely heavily on reinsurance in order to, to, to get enough capacity to sell into the state. 
uh, and that reinsurance pricing has gone through the roof if they can find it at all. And so that's immediately what's pressing. Then we've got to allow some more flexibility, which would be to allow for higher deductibles or allow for actual cash value on people's roofs. Listen, when you go out and if you have a 10 year old car and you get into a car accident, your insurance company will replace the car, but it doesn't buy you a brand new car. It gives you the money with, of the value of the car. Unfortunately, in Florida, we buy people brand new roofs. What's going on in Florida today is you and I are buying our neighbor's roofs and we're paying for it at higher premiums. Yeah. Uh, Jason Pizzo, let's go to another topic near and dear to you, and that is condo reform, structural safeness, safety. Uh, the uh, Champlain Tower South is in your district. You were there almost every day, I know, after it collapsed. And there was an attempt in the last legislative session to craft a bill which would have created a number of reforms, inspections sooner, recertification, and so on. Uh, what about a special session on condo safety and reform? This is uh, an issue that uh, Representative Perez in the House has worked hard on, as well as Senator Bradley in the Senate. There has been an impasse on two issues that remain uh, sort of, uh, you know, stalemating this effort, but I think we're very, very close. The governor indicated he would also accept a special session on this issue. What we'd like to do is run them concurrent with property insurance. The res it's uh, based on reserves and a couple of other issues uh, as it relates to condos, but I, but I think they're very, very close and I appreciate their efforts. Um, but, but again, and, and I know viewers watching, you know, for you, Bunna and Michael, when Senator Brandis is talking about property insurance or we're talking about condo reform, these are the things we should have been working on during session, right? I mean, these, these are the things that, that doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican or NPA, black, white, rich, poor, coastal, inland. These are the things we should have been working yeah. on. Well, these, these, these are critical could. issues. I mean, was too much time spent on these culture war issues, which the governor and some other Republican leaders were, were pushing? I mean, is that why you didn't get to condo reform? Uh, that's a very rhetorical question. It's an overwhelming yes. We, we were completely, you know, consumed by 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 crap that, that has nothing to do with improving your life, your safety, your neighborhood. Nothing. That's so, what we spent time doing. We didn't even get the budget done on time. Yeah. So you mentioned, Jason, you mentioned the, the reserves uh, is something that the, the Senate really got stuck on and uh, the House was ready to go. Just so everybody knows, that sticking point was uh, the House v version of this bill wanted to make mandatory reserves, a certain percentage mandatory for condo associations to keep in the bank. Uh, the Senate didn't want that. It, it would be hugely expensive for homeowners, maybe an unintended cost. But that's a very big deal in the specific Champlain Tower South issue is that mm -hmm. there were not enough reserves to do what needed to be done to keep that building now that we know up. So Jeff Brandis, I mean, that that is a... The, that reserve issue, that's a big one, is it not? It's huge. In fact, I would imagine most of the condos in the state of Florida don't have enough reserves to cover what their entire um, what their entire maintenance cost would be. It's one of those things we're going to have to take a bite out of and, and, and actually address. It, absolutely, it's critical, uh, but we can't bankrupt people in the process. And so I think that's the key is like, what's a meaningful amount of reserves uh, that we allow? Uh, what is the minimum amount of reserves that we allow? And, and then go forward from there. But what we see is people just kind of waiving all of their reserves and then hoping that, you know what, listen, I'm, I'm either gonna move or sell this condo uh, long before that bill comes due and we'll pass the buck on to somebody else. At some juncture, we have to take responsibility and realize that people have, you know, for decades have been ignoring the appropriate reserves in their condos. And now it's time to true up and, and actually put together a reasonable plan going forward. Jason, you're shaking your head, why? Well, I'm nodding my head. Um, so oh, I'm nodding my nod head. Nod is this way. Shake is this way. You were shaking. Shake is this way. This is nod. Yeah, I want to be uh, very clear. I, I just, but at the bottom rung of, of certain sort of economic situations, it is tantamount if you're inflexible about reserves, I believe, in displacing. We had this every year when vendors try to bring fire sprinkler install, installations and retrofits, that basically the special assessment was going to far outpace any, any mitigation of risk and lowering of premium. At the other end, you know, I proposed a bill and then therefore after an amendment that allowed for investment of some of these reserves. At the very least, my position is that you should not be able to, to waive reserves on structural issues, cosmetic, replacement, renovation, different situation, but, but not on structural. Again, you know, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., I'm hopping on a flight to Tallahassee and I'll see Senator Brandis up there. Uh, but again, these are things that we could have and should have been working on 
you know, to resolve, we passed maps, going back to the, the opening segment, we passed maps legislatively that passed the smell test mm -hmm. that, you know, that were not going to be challenged for House and for, and for State Senate. We, we could have and should have done the same for, you know, for others. Yeah. Politics is difficult. Uh, Senators Jason Pezzo and Jeff Brandis, great to have you on. I wish the legislature sort of talked to each other frankly and honestly the way you did here this morning. Thanks very They're much. They're roommates. That's why they have practice. <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Thank thanks. All right, redistricting raises constitutional concerns. We're going to revisit that subject. Will the governor's map hold up? We're going to ask the woman who fought for Florida's Fair Districts Amendment next. A little more than one decade ago, Florida voters approved a constitutional amendment that says congressional districts in the state cannot be drawn to favor the party in power, and these districts have to give minority voters the ability to elect people who look like themselves. Districts also have to be compact and contiguous, ending gerrymandering. That's when lawmakers draw whatever lines they could to protect voter majority. So how does the governor's version of the map hold up? Ellen Frieden leads Fair Districts Now, a redistricting reform group, and was the Miami lawyer who led the campaign for that 2010 amendment. It is so good to have you with us today. Welcome. Ellen, welcome. Great to be here. Great, great to see you. Thank you for all the work you have done to try and create fair congressional districts. What about this special session? Do you have any confidence that what the lawmakers do and the governor approves uh, is going to meet constitutional muster? Well, Michael and Glenna, this has been a very disheartening thing because as you mentioned, an overwhelming number of supermajority of voters voted in 2010 to stop rigging districts to favor a political party and to start protecting minority voters. And that's in our Florida constitution. And our current governor has decided that he doesn't want to draw districts like that. He doesn't want to follow the Constitution. And so what he's done is he has bulldozed his way very, uh, without, without precedent. Um, he has bulldozed his way into the redistricting process. He has bullied the legislature to try and draw a map that would please him. And pleasing him apparently requires or just basically erasing two of the four black districts in the state of Florida. And also, well, can I interrupt pleasing that, Ellen? him really requires yeah. drawing districts to favor his party. Yeah, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when you say to please him, as Glenna had mentioned earlier, he talked about race neutral districts, but the bottom line is that instead of four district districts represented by black representatives, if this uh, map goes through that he wants, there would be two, right? That's exactly right. And he is, he is eliminating the ability of black voices who have historically, in the last several years, been heard in Washington. He wants to eliminate their voice in Washington. And he's, but he's, but it, make no mistake about this. In addition to being a, an extremely racist move, what he's really doing is trying to rig districts to favor the Republican Party. Okay, let me let me and just interject that, here for a moment because sure. I, you know, to, to be fair, the governor and his people are not here. So let me just challenge the narrative for a little bit in an objective way. Um, the governor used the words race neutral. If if you look at the map, and we, we are efforting to put up his map at the moment. They are fairly compact and they are contiguous and they do follow natural boundaries as, as best a layperson like me could see doing my due diligence. If he says well, they're race neutral and if they, if they follow what fair districts in that amendment in compact and contiguous um, mandate, there is also the layered upon mandate of protecting minority voters, racial minorities and language minorities. So I guess my biggest question from front to back for months has been, how do you meld those two things and come up fairly? 
Well, it's not for me to meld and it's not for the governor to meld. It's for the legislature to meld and to follow the Constitution, because what the Constitution says is that the uh, protection of racial minorities, racial and, and language minorities, and the protection of all of us from politically rigging districts is paramount over compactness. And, and that's very clearly stated, that's what the people voted for. And that's the part that everybody seems to be ignoring. Um, compactness is great. We need compact, compact districts. But first and foremost, the, the reasons that we passed these amendments were to protect minority voters and to protect all of us from having our voices diluted. So I think somebody mentioned that um, earlier that um, in Flo we, Flo we have a 50-50 state in Florida. Our statewide elections are pretty much always determined within just a, you know, a few tens, a couple of tens of thousands of votes. They're very, very close. Okay, well, to and that point, though, that when, when we're, we're talking about um, the, the districts as drawn by the governor, 20 were Trump districts, eight would be Biden districts. But if you look at the numbers of the votes, 10 of those were very close votes between 49 and 55 percent. So they're not hardcore Trump or hardcore Biden districts. To your point, they were much more of a Florida vote that was razor close in those districts. Well, I you mean the Trump districts? Both. Is, is, that, Both. is that what you're saying? Well, the ten, yes, the 10 are Trump districts, but there were plenty yeah, of very well, close Biden districts it, as well. It, it, but they make no mistake. They're looking, they know how those districts are trending. And there's a reason they did that. Now, let me give you an example of what they what what he did that has nothing to do with minority voters. He took um, before there was a there was a congressional district in Hillsborough County, which is the Tampa area, and a congressional district in St. Petersburg which is, which is um, in, 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 um, in Pinellas County. And, um, and they were completely separated. Now what he's done is he has taken all of, not all, but a large number of Democrats and frankly, a large black population out of that St. Petersburg district, out of that Pinellas County district, he has basically split Pinellas County in half in order to make that district a much more Republican district. Yeah. And Ellen, if yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, we are running out of time. I would point out that in the district in South Florida, which is represented by Sheila uh, Scherfelis McCormick, uh, it remains a black performing district, but in fact, she has fewer uh, black residents within the district. So, but this is gonna be decided probably by the lawsuit you have filed in federal court and you go to trial on May 12th. Looks well, actually not. That that loss, it's not going to be decided in that lawsuit, but I think that given the governor's insistence on drawing a map that doesn't comply and he has basically said he doesn't approve, he doesn't want to continue having the fair districts amendments in force in Florida. Ellen, sit, sit uh, tight. We, we actually um, need to take a break. If you hear the music, that's the cue. <laughs> We're going to be back in two minutes. Sit tight. We'll be right back. We are speaking with Ellen Frieden, the foremost, I would say, one of the foremost people who have been in the weeds with redistricting since she shepherded the 2010 Florida Amendment to make them fair and square. Um, Ellen, when we went to the break, you were talking about the anticipated case next month. You have filed suit. Actually, your maps were due to the court tomorrow. Uh, what, what is the update on that lawsuit? Well, what what's that lawsuit was really filed in the event that the legislature and the governor don't agree on a map and there is no map. What we've done with that lawsuit is simply ask the court to um, order a map if the legislature and the governor can't do it. So a challenge is going to be brought will if they come up with if they pass the map that the governor has advanced right now there is little question that they will challenge it. And, you know, I have to take exception with what uh, Senator Brandis said 
about there's no way to ever avoid a challenge. That just isn't true. The legislative maps, the state house and state senate maps were drawn totally compliant with the fair districts amendments and they didn't get challenged this year. And the house and the senate and the house were on the road to passing a constitutionally compliant congressional map when the governor on the eve of Martin Luther King Day stepped in and submitted his map, the one that eliminates 50% of the black representation in the state of Florida. So now we have that map to put up. I, I'm not sure if you can see it, but our viewers will be able to see it as soon as it gets to the screen. Three, two, one, there it is. So, um, it, you know, it's clearly numbered with the districts. You, you know it well. Uh, 28th district, which will be the keys, is the brand new district that Florida gets, number 28, based on population growth. And the, the black representation uh, that you're talking about is centered around Duval County, Orange County in the middle, and then upper, you know, like Broward, uh, Palm Beach. So what about those areas which are traditionally, for Florida, the, the black vote? What about that changes specifically now that we're looking at the map? Well, the the there is presently a, a an African American access district that spans the part the North Florida area between Jacksonville and Tallahassee along the state line. And in that dis, in that present district, there is a large population of black voters in Jacksonville, another large population in Tallahassee, um, of the only black majority county in the state of Florida is included in that district and a lot of other smaller black communities that, um, that have living in them uh, ancestors of people who were enslaved in those areas. And those people are now gonna be without a voice in Washington. Yeah, you know, Ellen, plan. We, we should point out that in addition to the Fair Districts Amendment, which was approved by nearly 63% of Florida voters in 2010, there also is another huge uh, law, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that uh, obtains in this issue as well. I mean, there is a lot in the Constitution and in the laws of the United States that are trying to guarantee equal representation for all people in Congress. So one has to ask, why is this happening at this time in this state? Well, politics is the answer. Uh, and that's not a put down of Governor DeSantis. Maybe a Democratic governor would try and ram through the same thing. As it happens, it is Governor DeSantis in charge. Well, there's no question that redistricting is probably the most politically charged thing that a legislature is ever asked to do. Usually the governor doesn't get involved. But in this year, when we do have a governor who is apparently running for president or thinks he's going to run for president, um, is, is he's trying to please the national party people by creating more seats that Republicans can win for Congress. And that it's just so obvious that what's going on here, and this is exactly why the Fair Districts Amendments were passed in 2010. People in the state of Florida don't think that politicians should use our districts for purposes, for their own political purposes, or for purposes of advancing their political futures. And that's really what's what's happening here. Un, very sadly, we're taking a big step backwards. We're cutting black representation and we're going to um, to back to gerrymandering like we were before the Fair Districts Amendments. Like like so much of what has gone on this session, there are two wholly separate perspectives mm -hmm. and um, likely will be decided by the courts. So Ellen Frieden, so nice to have you and appreciate your perspective and we value your time. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks for put, shining a light on this very important issue. We will indeed. All right, we are all watching the tragic events that have been unfolding in Ukraine and we've been wondering, what can we do to help? 
Miami-Dade Commission Chair Jose Pepe Diaz didn't just wonder, he got on a plane and went to look. And we're going to talk with him live after the break. With the world focused on Russia's war on Ukraine, leaders around the world are increasingly focused on the humanitarian disaster that has created. And local leaders are also focused on how to help that terrible situation. Miami-Dade Commission Chairman Jose Pepe Diaz is just back from a quick visit to the Poland, Poland's border with Ukraine. He joins us now live via Zoom. Pepe Diaz, great to see you. Good morning. It's Good great. afternoon. What time is it? Where are we? Uh, it's still Jet morning. Well, no, it's, yeah, afternoon. Afternoon. Good morning to both of you, uh, Glenna and Michael, and Easter to everybody. Um, We've been watching yeah, your uh, Twitter feed and your photographs from the border there. It looks like you saw some pretty horrible images up close and personally. Yes, we did. It's uh, extremely sad, Glenna. Um, you can't imagine until you're there and see those people and um, the way they, they came across the border that uh, Medica, which is the, the only border that allows people to walk across too. And of course, on the other side, the cars, um, but the people walking across with, uh, some had, uh, some had uh, luggage to be able to carry some of the things that they had, whatever they could in a luggage and a piece of luggage. Some had bags, um, kids, women, uh, elderly, uh, one uh, young man with his carrying his dog that looked like a guy injured but he i don't know for how far they must have been walking to get to that border the one thing i'll tell you they were all extremely thankful uh to make it over to poland um they came from nothing and yeah. they just took yeah. what they barely could take with them and, and make it there well it's it's heartbreaking especially those children i mean you look at the faces of the children this is a living room war i mean they first called vietnam the living room war but this one every day we get to see it and you saw it up close and personal what about children were you able to talk to some kids pepe yes yes i did i talked to we went uh you know the people from uh, michael caponi from uh um, yeah. global empowerment uh mission that they're out of here out of Doral. i got to meet with them over there and they took me to a place as the expo center which is our, our convention center which they had about 3100 uh, people there uh families with their young kids, elderly, um, because the young uh, young men after 18 to 55 are required to stay and fight for their country. So I got to speak to kids. Uh, I got to, uh, and we had a translator go with us. It was beyond heartbreaking uh, to hear their stories here. We talked to one lady, young lady, that she had lost her father and her two brothers uh, the second, I believe the second day this started and it took them about 10 days, uh, to make it to, to this, uh, to the border. And then they were sitting there. The, we went to a part where there was a kids playing. Um, and, and most of them just sat there and looked at, into like nowhere. Um, they're just, you know, we think about what we're going to do tomorrow and the next day. Imagine that all of a sudden bombs start dropping here and, and, and you got to run with whatever you can get and just try to make it somewhere. Wow. And, and that's where these people are at. They don't know what their lives is going to be after that. And most of them don't even know how their family members that they left behind are doing or their neighbors or whatever. It it's is, a it very is intense, trauma. Sad, sad situation. Yeah, I mean, tra trauma upon trauma. So, so you went not as, not personally, you went in your capacity as chair of Miami-Dade's commission. So locally, here's the pesky reporter question. Locally, what can you and the county do? Um, was this a taxpayer-funded trip? What, what? now that you've seen this, what is in store for the county's role? Well, br bring it on home for us. Okay. To bring it on home, I went to look at it. First and foremost, about seven, six, no, about seven weeks ago, uh, I got visited by the president of the Polish Senate that came, you know, the speaker, that came and uh, visited with me about finding uh, some trade capacities and some things. So we built a relationship. When this whole thing started, I reached out to him and he said in anything that could help to please do so. And of course we do this in Miami-Dade County. We go to help people 
Haiti, wherever there's a disaster, there are people from our community. That's what we do, especially Odessa is one of our sister city ports in Miami-Dade County, and I'm in charge of the international issues. So that is something we did, we do. Uh, we went ahead and, uh, like I said, GEM, Global Empowerment Mission, invited us. They're out of Doral. I wanted to see their organization. I wanted to see that the money that the people would send will get actually to the people of yeah. need. And, and are God. you, Pepe, are, are you confident that, in fact, that donations that are made to oh, yeah. Global Empowerment, also oh, yeah. to Jose Andres and World Kitchen, yes. these are fabulous yes. Organizations and their great organizations, great integrity, and I imagine they're working. Uh, what? But I think to Glenna's question, what can Miami-Dade County do well, to help? We could, we could. The first and foremost thing is uh, we ask our employees to put in time, which turns into money. Uh, I have a resolution. I'm going to be putting that out uh, as soon as possible. We also want to check that companies that also help out tremendously within our, our county, um, many of them have called me and said, hey, how do we donate? Are you guys going to do something? What are you going to do? I don't want this to turn into a trip uh, that, I mean, I don't want this to turn into something that we help people and then find out that the money went elsewhere. So that's why I went. I went with a gentleman, George Casadas, a former Miami-Dade police officer, also a Marine. And we made sure we went to the warehouse in Rizoso. I believe I pronounced it right. If I didn't, I'm sorry. Uh, they have warehouses there. They have a huge warehouse. If you look on my on my side, you'll see what the warehouses look like. In fact, there was a lot of product from Goya there. And what they do is they get those products and they, they, they uh, get these uh, 18 wheelers and they take it to the border. At the border, they go ahead and they dispatch it to several different trucks. Those trucks make it into the areas that are most affected. So what could we do? I went to verify. I verified, I came back and I'm telling everybody that if you're gonna give, if you feel that you need to help out, which I hope you do, that you could go ahead and give and write out a check or work or call these people and see what you could send um, because they need the help. They really do. Yeah. Every day it's getting worse and worse there. And we're gonna do everything we can with the county. I met with the mayor. Briefly yesterday, she went to greet me at the airport. She's all in with her, the administration. Whatever we could do, that's what we're going to do, Glenna. And, and I know it's hard because you always have those out there that um, no matter what you do, there's nothing good that comes out of it. But let me tell you, if you, if, if you were there and saw it personally and you saw the suffering, and here, and then Poland is perfect. Poland is us. Um, there's nothing on you could get gas. Everything looks normal. They absorbed yeah. already three uh, three million, three million in their refugees. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Pepe Diaz, uh, we're grateful for your account of this harrowing situation and wish you well. And uh, let's all help the people of Ukraine. Thank Thanks you, very Mr. Much. Chair. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Have a great Easter. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back. If you would like to re-watch today's interviews, there's always something the second time that you missed. Or you can listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast. All you have to do is grab your phone, open up your camera, scan this QR code right there on your screen, and it'll take you to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. And of course, we thank you for being with us here this hour. Happy Easter, Passover, Ramadan, whatever you are celebrating this weekend. Remember, we're online 24-7. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved, and have a great holiday.